Hello and welcome once again to another Dangerous Goods Toolbox training film from Dan Lee Training. Uh, for those of you who are involved in the use of dangerous goods and their transportation or health and safety in the workplace or chemical safety. Once you've viewed this film, please press subscribe and if you haven't done so lately, please check out the other titles on our YouTube channel. In this film, we're going to explore the world of dangerous goods and in particular, the overpack. All too often, we see this type of packaging incorrectly applied in both road, air and sea dangerous goods shipments, which is surprising really, as it is quite simple to apply once you know the basic rules. So before we begin, let's just remind ourselves of the basic rules that underlie the use of an overpack. Overpacks apply to dangerous goods which have already been classified, identified, packed and marked and labelled. This subject has been covered in our earlier film, Introduction to Dangerous Goods. Usually, dangerous goods packages are sent secured to a pallet with their labels and marks clearly displayed for all in the transport chain to see. However, an overpack situation occurs where the type of outer packaging used prevents those in the transport chain from clearly seeing the marks and labels on the original packages. Such examples can be clear shrink wrap wrapped too many times around the package which obscures the original labels and marks, or black shrink wrap wrapped around packages, and protective cartons placed over the pallet, and on some occasions crates used to ship several items of dangerous goods packages and machinery. Now have you ever considered what the purpose of dangerous goods labels and marks are? Well, they're a method to warn all of those involved in the transport train as to the nature or the danger of risk that the products contained within the packages possess. They're a method of identifying so that each transport chain can place or load these items where they won't dangerously react with other loads. Now, this process is known as segregation, and we'll cover this in a future film. But for our purposes today, let's all agree that the use of the required marks and labels is an essential element to ensure the safe transportation of dangerous goods. So let's examine this using a set number of dangerous goods packages as illustrated here. As you can see, each package clearly displays the required marks and labels as required by the dangerous goods codes. When we place these onto a pallet with other non-dangerous goods items, then we are fully legally compliant with each dangerous goods code. However, if we now wrap this pallet in black shrink wrap, we hide or obscure the original marks and labels and we now have an overpack situation. Just a quick cautionary word here. All dangerous goods packages within an overpack must have their own marks and labels displayed on their own packaging. You cannot cheat and have the packages within an overpack unmarked and unlabeled. So let's see what the dangerous goods manuals say about overpacks. We have three main ones to choose from, ADR, IMDG, and IATA. And I put them in that order because how else do you get your goods to the marine port or the airport? Well, it's by road. So ADR, the road regulations, come first. Then 90% of the world's freight moves by sea transport. So IMDG is second. And lastly, it's IATA. Because if you've no option other than to send it by air freight, you may as well get the basics in place before IATA put their own risk controls on it. So remember, it's the road regulations first, and in Europe, we use ADR. So in the ADR manuals, overpacks are detailed in Volume 2, Part 5, Section 1. And here's what they require overpacks to have. A label stating overpack. Minimum height must be 12 millimeters. And this has to be in a language of the forwarding country. And if that language is not English, French or German, then it has to have that wording in either English, French or German. Next, it requires the UN numbers of the products or substances contained on the packages within the overpack to be clearly displayed. The labelling requirements of Chapter 5.2 refer to one of each of the hazard class labels to be displayed on the outside that represents each of the classes, including their subsidiary risks, of the products or substances within the overpack. As you can see from this illustration, each product within the overpack has had its respective hazard class labels 
duplicated on the Overpax exterior. Note, you only need one hazard class label to represent multiple packages of the same class. For instance, if your overpack contained 22 packages containing class 3 flammable liquids and 2 packages containing class 8 corrosive products, then the overpack would only need to display one class 3 label and one class 8 label. But if one of the class 3 packages had a toxic subsidiary hazard, class 6.1, then you would need to display that subsidiary risk label too. So in that case, you would need to be displaying a class 3, class 8, and a class 6.1 hazard label. ADR also states that the overpack should contain any representative mark. These include the limited quantity and accepted quantity marks, the lithium battery marks, and orientation arrows. Any relevant package mark required, such as the environmentally hazardous mark or keep away from heat, or any other mark or label specified by the product's classification or special provisions, must also be replicated on the overpack's outer cover. Now, if any of your products or substances within the overpack are liquids contained in combination packages, then that package will display two orientation arrow marks, one on each opposite side. All labels and marks must be clearly displayed. Some hazard class labels that use the black colour can have their shape and meaning obscured by the surrounding black shrink wrap, as shown in this illustration. This is a particular problem where the limited quantity mark is used. As the consigner, you have the legal responsibility to ensure that all marks and labels are clearly displayed, so you may have to purchase marks and labels that have a white border to allow them to be displayed properly and clearly. So that's what ADR requires. Now let's look at the additional risk controls required by the Sea and Air Dangerous Goods Codes. Sea Transport requires the provision of the products or substances proper shipping name. The proper shipping name is the name given alongside the UN number for the product or substance and is often referred to as the chemical name, for example, methanol. But a proper shipping name can also relate to articles or machinery and apparatus that contain dangerous goods. Again, example, aerosols or lithium batteries or engines. Whatever is identified within the code's dangerous goods list as being the required proper shipping name for the product or substance, that must be used. If any of the products are identified as a marine pollutant, then that mark must also be displayed on the outer cover of the overpack, just as it is on the original packaging within the overpack. Sea shipments do not require anything else. Everything that has been performed under the road regulations meets their requirements too. Air shipments also accept what the road regulations provide for in overpacks, but then they add a little bit more detail. This is due to their transport risk factors. Your overpack might be travelling on a plane that is also carrying 300 plus passengers, so the air cargo personnel are going to make sure that your overpack is fully and properly compliant. Dangerous goods by air shipments like sea shipments also want the proper shipping name of the products and substances within to be clearly written alongside the respective UN numbers. Additionally, dangerous goods by air require the consigner to identify the net quantity of any dry ice that is being used to keep any part or the whole part of the overpack cool. The total quantity of the dangerous goods within the overpack must also be displayed. Dangerous goods by air also requires whether or not salvage packaging has been used within the overpack. If the dangerous goods by air manual identifies that the product or substance can only be shipped by cargo aircraft only, then this mark must be replicated on the overpack's outer. The orientation arrows can be supplemented with additional wording, like this way up. Finally, and this is a really good idea from the Dangerous Goods by Air manual, if there are more than one overpacks in the consignment, then each overpack must be numbered to aid identification and their consolidation. For example, overpack number one of three, or and overpack number two of three, etc. So that's what overpacks are. Let's summarise what we've learnt. Overpacks are caused where the original markings on the dangerous goods packages cannot be seen due to some type of cover 
that hides or obscures the original labels and markings from view. These coverings are usually black plastic shrink wrap, but can be cardboard outers or wooden or plastic crates. Overpacks require all relevant labels and marks to be displayed on the outside of the outer covering along with the UN numbers and the proper shipping names. A label that clearly states that what you are looking at is an overpack and where the contents contain dangerous goods in liquid form in combination packages within then two orientation arrows are required. Air transport will require additional risk controls for specific types of packaging, dry ice and an overpack number if multiple overpacks are used within the consignment. Also, net quantities may need to be provided and clearly stated. Overpacks are simple to apply. How is it then that many freight forwarders are now charging consigners for labelling and marking problems? Well, this can only be down to one thing. Consigners don't know what they need to know in order to comply with the dangerous goods regulations and are therefore incorrectly marking and labelling their overpacks. Such problems can cause unnecessary delays to your shipments and additional costs. If in doubt, always consult with your company dangerous goods safety advisor. If you don't have one, you need to get one as the law will soon change. You can always call us at Danley Training to discuss your ongoing dangerous goods safety advisor requirements. So let's quickly test your knowledge. You might want to hit the pause button. Thanks for watching this short film. Don't forget by clicking on subscribe, you also get notification when our next film is published. And don't forget to check out our other Dangerous Goods Films titles too. If Dan Lee Training can assist you with any aspect of your Dangerous Goods compliance requirements by being your DGSA or providing you with additional training, then please contact us on the email and telephone numbers that appear on the screen. Until our next film, goodbye.